Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Perry Ground. All right. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you so much. And thank you to the National Museum of the American Indian for inviting me back here to come and share some stories with you again. I always love to come down to this museum and share my stories. Just in case any of you don't know this, this uh, museum is part of the Smithsonian Institute, which is, of course, made up of 19 different museums. And not only is there this building that is part of the National Museum of the American Indian, but there is another facility up in New York City uh, where they have exhibits and programs as well. So if you're ever in New York City, you'd like to learn more about Native Americans, you can visit the sister facility up there. If you turn and wave at the camera, we'll say hello to everyone watching us on their website, uh, at nmai.si.edu. And like Vinny was just saying, if you'd ever like to see more about the storytelling or if there's parts that you don't see today, you can go to the website and some of this material is being archived. So you can either see it again or see it for the first time, one or the other, okay? All right, my name is Perry Ground and I am a Turtle Clan member of the Onondaga Nation. And the Onondagas are part of a larger group of people that joined together about 1,000 years ago. And today most people know us by a name that was given to us, not the name that we have for ourselves. Most people know us by the name Iroquois or Iroquois. How many people have heard this word before, Iroquois? Oh, lots of hands go up. Yeah, well, the Iroquois, lots of people get confused. They think that it is just one tribe, but that's not true. The Iroquois are really a union or a confederacy of originally five tribes that joined together. Later on, we added another one. So today, we have six tribes that are part of our union. And these six tribes include the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, which is where I come from, the Cayugas, and the Senecas, which is where my dad comes from. Have we heard any of those names before? How many people have heard some of those names? Okay, there's more hands, yeah. Well, most people call us the Iroquois or Iroquois, and that name comes to us from another group of Native Americans that spoke a completely different kind of language. Usually today we call them Algonquins. And those Algonquin people, they called us in their language Iroquois, Iroquois, and in their language that word means rattlesnake people, rattlesnake people, because a long time ago we didn't get along with them very well, so they called us snake people. So when you call us Iroquois or Iroquois, like the English speaking people say, you are calling us snake people, not a very nice name to call us. In our own languages we call ourselves Hodinosoni, Hodinosoni, which in English translates to the people who built the long house. Or sometimes we just say people of the long house. And that's what we call ourselves. Much better than being a snake person, don't you think? Yeah, yeah much better than that. Okay, so the stories I want to share with you today come from the people who built the long house. That collection of originally five tribes, and then when the Tuscaroras came and joined us, that sixth tribe, we included some of their stories in the ones that we would tell. So these stories come from all of the people of the long house. So let's have a story. The first story that I want to tell you today is a very, very fun story to tell. It's actually one of the very first stories that I ever learned to tell years ago. And it's about two animals that live in the forest. So we have to know what these animals look like, okay? So the first animal we're going to learn a little bit about is the owl. Does everyone know what an owl looks like? Yeah? Does owl have little squinty eyes or does he have big round eyes? Which one? Yeah, he's got big round eyes, big round eyes. Sometimes we call this how owl got big eyes. Now another uh, animal that we're going to learn about is the rabbit. Does everyone know what a rabbit looks like? Yeah. Does a rabbit have little short ears or big long ears? Which one? Yeah, big long ears. You got it. Yeah, sometimes we call this how rabbit got long ears. So let's have this story about the owl and the rabbit. Well, we say this story happened a long, long time ago, back when the great Turtle Island was brand new. 
And that is what Haudenosaunee people call this place that we live on. We call it Great Turtle Island. Well, back when the Great Turtle Island was new, Sakwiyodizo, which is our word for God or the Creator, Sakwiyodizo came down onto the Turtle Island and he was looking around at all of the beautiful things that were here. But as he was looking around at these beautiful things, he got a thought up in his mind. And he thought, you know, these animals, they did not have the choice of how they wanted to look. Maybe someone wanted a longer nose. Maybe someone wanted a shorter nose. Maybe someone wanted big muscles. Well, whatever it might be, he decided to give them that choice. And he set about the Turtle Island, changing the animals to however they wanted to look. Now imagine if you had the choice of how you could look forever. That would be pretty exciting, don't you think? Ooh, yeah. And animals that live in the forest, ooh, they love to talk to one another. And word of this changing, it got around the forest very quickly. And the animals became very excited. Many of them gathered together in a big clearing in the forest. Sakwiyodizo, the creator, he came into that clearing. Whoo! He saw all the animals there. And he knew there would be a lot of changing that day. So he bent down and he picked up the little rabbit to get started with her. And he stroked Mrs. Rabbit from the top of her head, right by her little short ears, all the way down to her bushy tail. Rabbit loves it when you do that to her. Mrs. Rabbit, said the creator, how is it that I can change you? How is it that you would like to look? Oh, well, Rabbit gets to thinking about this. This is a big decision. How does she want rabbits to look forever? And while she is thinking about it, there is someone up in a nearby tree branch and he knew how he wanted to look. So he called out, Sakwiyodizo, creator, over here, over here, over here! I am the owl, and I know how I want to look. I want huge, powerful wings like the eagle has, so I can go up very high in the sky. But I would also like to have a long and beautiful neck so I can look around and see everything going on around me. Well, the creator is holding on to that rabbit, and he turned over to the owl, and he said, No, owl, it's good that you know how you want to look, but you need to wait your turn. Rabbit is getting changed first. I'll change you next. Oh, the owl was excited to hear that. He was going to get changed next. Well, just then the little rabbit turns up her face, and she looks up at the creator, and she says, I know how it is that I would like to look. I have four short, stubby little legs. I cannot run very quickly. Wolf and coyote are always nipping at my tail, trying to eat me up for dinner. I would like nice, long legs, like the deer has. Then I could run quickly, stay away from wolf and coyote. Oh, rabbit, that's very wise of you, said the creator. And I can do that, no problem. And then he turned to all of the other animals that were there, and he said, I need you all to close your eyes, cover up your faces, turn your heads away. I'm using very special magic. No one is allowed to look. So all those animals, they tucked their faces away, and they closed up their eyes, all except for one. It was that owl up in the tree. He knew he was going to be changed next, and he wanted to see what was going on. So that owl, oh, he made a big show of putting his wings up over his eyes. And then he spread out his wing feathers so he could peek through to see what was happening. Well, Sakwiyodizo, he thought all the animals had turned their faces away, so he grabbed a hold of that rabbit right by the top of her head, right by her little short ears. And then he reached around, and he grabbed onto her little short back legs. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Rabbit. This isn't going to hurt you, he said. He 
gathered in all of his magic. And he started to pull. And he was pulling and pulling and pulling. And those legs started to get longer and longer and longer. Just like the rabbit wanted. But we know that when we pull on one end of something, we're pulling on the other end also. And Sakmiodizo was holding on to the rabbit's ears. And all of a sudden, they started to stretch out. And they were getting longer and longer and longer. Oh, 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 oh my, look at this, laughed the creator. Rabbit is getting long and floppy ears. Oh, I'll have to push those back in before I'm done. Rabbit wants long legs, not long ears. Well, he's pulling and pulling and pulling, and those legs are getting longer and longer, and those ears are getting longer and longer. When all of a sudden he gets the feeling that someone is looking at him. Have you ever had that feeling that someone is watching you, and you look around to see who's there? Oh, Sakmino Diesel looked around, and what did he see? But owl up in the tree, peeking through. Oh, that owl tried to cover up like he hadn't done it. But the creator had seen him, and he was very angry. Oh, he was so angry, he dropped down that rabbit, and he rushed up. He said, oh, oh, are you looking at me? And he got right up into the owl's face. And just like our young friend here, whoo, Owl became very afraid. And his eyes got big with fright. And because the creator had all of his magic gathered in, Owl's eyes got stuck that way. And he has big, round, scared-looking eyes right to this day. Oh, but Sakrino Diesel, he's angry. So he grabbed a hold of that owl. He plucked him out of the tree. He gave him a shake and mm, he pushed his head right down into his shoulders. And he said, Owl, as a punishment for what you've done, instead of a long, beautiful neck, now you'll have no neck. And does Owl have any neck right to this day? Oh, no. But then Peter said, Oh, Owl, I'm so angry with you. I want you to fly away. I don't want to see your face anymore. So the Owl flew off, and he started to live in dark places, like caves or hollow trees. Maybe today in barns. He only comes out at night. Doesn't want anyone to see his face. But now Sakuino Dizo turns around to finish stretching out the little rabbit. But when he turned, whoosh, she was gone. All the animals were gone. When he had yelled, it was louder than thunder. They had all become frightened and run away. Even the rabbit, even though she wasn't done getting stretched out. He looked all around for her, but she was way down in her burrow, and she would not come out. So he decided, all of the animals will have to stay the way that they are. I can't take the chance of anyone looking at my magic. And that's why, to this day, Rabbit has little, short, stubby front legs and long, stretched out back legs. She has to hop all around. It's also why Rabbit has long and floppy ears, because she ran away before the Creator could tuck them back in. And now I will say to you, Daneho. When you hear me say Daneho, that means I am done, or those are my words. It's like the end. Daneho. That story is done. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. We didn't scare you too much, did we? No, you see, you never know what's going to happen when there's storytelling, when all of a sudden the storyteller might come flying into the audience. I was going to run up to the people that were just coming in, but I was afraid they'd turn around and go right back out. So I thought I'd better not do that one. This guy seems like he's pretty settled in right there. So, yeah. And last year, actually, I was telling a different story about a bear, and he was running around. And he goes running, and it's very slippery up here. And I start to slide, and I kept sliding and kept sliding, and I was like... I think I'm going to end up on these people over here. Fortunately, I caught myself, toes hanging right off the edge. But it was a close thing. So that time I came down on purpose. Okay, all right. So you never know what could happen when you're telling stories. And actually, oh, we got a little microphone twisted around. There we go. One time I was telling that story. I was out in Ohio, and I was telling that story at a festival. 
And there was a young boy, and he was playing on some hay bales that were close by. And he was listening, sort of half paying attention, half not paying attention. And when I got to that part of the story, I went rushing up to him over on those hay bales, and he turned at me and he looked like this. <laughs> and about one second after that, he was about 100 yards down the festival. I don't think his feet hit the ground for quite a ways. He was gone. And I'm yelling, stop, come back, it's okay. He kept going. Uh, the festival had probably about 500 yards to the end of it. He didn't stop until he got to the end. So <laughs> he got in quite a workout that day, I guess. So never know what can happen when you're telling these stories. Okay, all right. So again, for those of you just joining us, my name is Perry Ground, Turtle Clan member of the Onondaga Nation. And these stories come to us from upstate New York. And so when we think about sharing our stories, we have people today from a bunch of different parts country. I'm from upstate New York, Thurza, who will be up here with me later at 3 o'clock, and maybe you saw her earlier at 11. She is from Minnesota in sort of the uh, uh, Great Lakes area and is part Ojibwe, sharing stories from that tradition as well. And Jean, who was out in the atrium just a bit ago, is from Alaska. And so you're hearing stories from all these different parts of the country. And some of the stories are very, very different. But I think something that's important to know is that all of these native people are telling stories. That's something that's the same about all of us. Every place I go, all around this whole country, whenever I meet Native American people, one of the first things they want to do is they want to share with me one of their stories. And I love to sit down and listen to them. So I think that that is something fantastic that we all have in common, is the way that we like to share our stories. These stories that we have inside of us that, oh, they just want to come out. And we just love to share them. So I'm happy to be here sharing these stories with you from the people of the Long House. As you go around the museum today, you're going to see all kinds of artwork. And artwork is another way for us to share our stories. If you've been around, you might even have seen one of these already. Right here in my hand, I have what we call a wampum belt. Wampum belt. And wampum, these little beads in purple and white, are made from the shell of the quahog clam. And the quahog is a clam that lives in the Atlantic Ocean. So knowing that the Haudenosaunee people, where I come from, live in upstate New York, you would know that we didn't live next to the ocean. So the only way that we could get these clamshells was to go to the ocean and trade with the Native American people that live there. And so we would get these clamshells from them. We also got stories and songs and dances and all kinds of things from them. But here's one thing we got. And then when we would take them home, we'd string the clamshells together to make belts. And these wampum belts are not something that we wear. This down here is a belt. It holds up my pants. That's what that belt's for. This belt over here is a belt to tell a story. And each wampum belt has a pattern or a picture in it that we would use to tell a story or to convey a message. This belt right here is a treaty belt, a treaty that we made with the Dutch people in the year 1634. And it was the very first treaty made between Haudenosaunee people and people that had come across the ocean. And the Dutch people asked us if they could live here with us. And we said, yes, this river will be for you. And you can have all of your things in it. Your boats, your clothes, your, clothes, your language, your religion, your government, all of your ways of life. Your donuts, because the Dutch people brought donuts here when they came across the ocean. This other river will be for the Haudenosaunee people. And we will travel in our canoe in that river. And we'll have all of our things. We'll have our language, our songs, our stories, our religion, our government, all of our ways of living. And that the two rivers would never interfere with one another. They will travel next to each other in parallel. So what this treaty was all about was about peaceful coexistence between two very different cultures of people, the Dutch people and the Haudenosaunee and that we could live next to each other and share the things that we have with each other. Because one of the things we said in this treaty was that if someone wanted to step from one river over to the other and get something from the other group of people or learn about the other group of people, 
Because believe me, I love donuts. Okay? We could step over to that other river and we could get those things. And then we could step back to our own river. I will always be Onondaga, no matter how many donuts I eat. Okay? I'll never be a Dutch person. But we can always learn those things from each other and we can step back and forth from one river to the other. So the idea was to share, but to exist peacefully, coexist peacefully with each other. That's right here in this wampum belt. So that's a story belt right there. Okay, we have lots of wampum belts that tell our stories, like the ones that I'm sharing with you today. And I got another story that I want to tell you right now that is a very, very fun story to tell. But what a lot of our stories do for us is that they teach us lessons about the proper way to behave. Should that owl have waited his turn? Yeah, he sure should have. Otherwise, he wouldn't have ended up with no neck. We don't want to end up with no neck, do we? No, so we'll wait our turn. Yeah, unlike that owl. So we can learn those lessons in our stories like that. This story I want to tell you right now is a lesson story. Yeah, well, he's got big eyes. Yeah, absolutely. We have another story that we tell about dolls. If you go upstairs on the third floor, you'll see some big cases, and you'll see some dolls made by Seneca people. Like I said, that's where my dad is from. The Seneca people make their dolls with no face. And we make those dolls that way because of a story that we tell about the no-face doll. Absolutely. So you can learn about that upstairs in the museum. We got all kinds of stories that explain those things and explain things in the world around us. Did you ever wonder why Rabbit had long ears? Well, now you know. They got stretched out. Okay? All right. So I want to tell you a story about some birds right now. About some birds. And who can tell me what is something that birds like to do? Yeah, well, I don't know. She's gotten used to her long ears, I think. Yep, she's accustomed to them. Yep. How about some birds, though? What do birds like to do? They like to fly. That's one thing. Anything else that birds like to do? They like to f eat fish and eat worms. Anything else that birds like to do? How about... They do hatch eggs, but what's something else that birds like to do? I'm giving you a hint. They like to sing. Yeah, birds love to sing. But a long, long time ago, the birds didn't know how to sing. They could only talk like we do. So I want to tell you a story about how the birds learned how to sing. Let's have this story. Well, we say this story happened a long, long time ago, back when the great Turtle Island was brand new. And back at this time, Sakriot Dizo came down onto the Turtle Island, and he was looking around at all of the beautiful things that were here. But as Sakriot Dizo, the creator, was looking around at these beautiful things, elder brother, the sun, was starting to poke his head up over the eastern horizon. And as Elder Brother the Sun was poking his head up, Sacriondizo heard a man come out of his long house. And he faced off to the east, and he lifted up his voice in a beautiful, beautiful song. It was the morning song. And he was saying thank you to his elder brother for coming up and shining his light down on the Turtle Island, making us all warm and letting life come forth on this world. Oh, that made the Creator very happy to hear the man sing that song. But as he was sitting and listening to the man sing, he noticed that in the trees all around this village, there were hundreds and hundreds of birds. And they had come to listen also. And they were straining their ears to hear the man sing that song. Well, Sakuino Dizo looked around all day, and after a time had gone by, Elder Brother started to go down in the west, and he was laying down to go to sleep for the night. And once again, Sakuyo heard that man come out of his long house, and he faced off to the west, and he lifted up his voice in another beautiful song. It was the evening song. He was saying thank you to the sun for doing his job that day, and asking him to come up again tomorrow. 
We still sing those songs right to this day. But again, Sacuino Dizo saw hundreds and hundreds of birds in the trees around the village. And it was then that he realized something was missing from the forest. The birds did not know how to sing. They could only talk like we do. So this gave him a good idea. Sacuino Dizo, he called all those birds together in a big council. And when everyone had gotten together, he stood up on the council rock and he said, All of you birds, listen to me. I have seen you listening to the human beings sing their songs. Would all of you like to be able to sing like the people do? <gasps> oh, yes we would! Yes we would! Yell the birds! We would love to be able to sing! And this made the Creator very happy that the birds wanted to sing those songs of thanksgiving. Oh, so he said to all of them, Tomorrow morning, when Elder Brother pokes his head up over the horizon, I want all of you to lift off into the sky, jump up as high as you can, flap your wings as high as you can go. And when you can go no higher, turn and glide back down to the Turtle Island. On your way down, you will hear a song in your ears. Listen to it. Remember it. Because that will be your song. You will sing it until all the end of all the days. Oh, the birds, they were overjoyed to hear this. They were each going to get their own song. But then Sakunodizo said something else to make sure they would go up as high as they could go. He said, whichever one of you goes the highest into the sky, you will get the best song. Oh, the birds were very, very excited to hear this. And then he left them to make their preparations. Oh, the birds were all talking about how great their songs were going to be and how high up they were going to go. But there was one bird that was excited most of all. And his name was Eagle. An eagle is a tall bird that has very, very big wings. His wings go apart at least six feet, like my arms do. And that eagle was sure that he was going to go up the highest. He was so sure that he was going to go the highest that he unfurled his wings, he puffed out his chest, and he started to stomp around and strut around. I'm going to go the highest, he would say. I'm going to get the best song. Look at these powerful wings. They will carry me up very high. Look at you, little robin, with your little wings. Oh, ho, ho, ho. no match for my powerful wings. And you, little sparrow. Oh, ho, ho. those wings won't take you anywhere. My wings are much better than yours. And he was making everyone feel very bad inside. Well, there was one bird that felt bad most of all. A little small bird, only like this tall. Wings only go this far apart. And his name is Thrush. And that little Thrush with his little tiny wings, he looked up at the eagle and his big powerful wings, and he thought, there is no way I can go up that high. And he felt very bad. But the next time that eagle came walking around, bragging and boasting about how high he was going to go, the thrush saw that there was a little pocket of feathers right under the eagle's wing. And that thrush thought to himself, you know, eagle is so busy bragging and boasting that if I jumped right up under there, he wouldn't even notice me. And I'm so small, I bet he would carry me right up into the sky. Sure enough, the next time that eagle came walking around, waving his wings, talking about how high he was going to go, Thrush jumped right up under there. He tucked himself in, and he got himself nice and comfortable. Eagle was so busy going on about how big he was, he never even noticed. That Thrush, he got himself so comfortable in there, he put his head down, and he fell asleep. 
Well, after some time had gone by, the birds noticed that the sky in the east, it was starting to get bright. Elder brother was getting ready to come up for the day, and everyone was very excited. Oh, they started stretching themselves out and getting themselves ready and flexing their wings, and all of a sudden they heard the man come out of his long house. He lifted up his voice in that beautiful morning song, and they got more excited. And just then, boop! The sun poked his head up over the hills and the birds jumped up into the air as high as they could go. They started to flap their wings as hard and as fast as they could and up and up and up all the birds went. Hundreds of birds, so many birds, it looked like it was nighttime again. Whew, covered the whole sky. Now there are some birds that can't fly up into the sky very high. Some birds like the chicken can't go up very high. So that little chicken went up a little ways and came right back down. And that chicken got that kind of kind of song. Is that a very beautiful song? It is to the chicken. Another bird that can't go up very high, Mr. Turkey went up a little ways and he can't go up high. He started to come back down. And that turkey got that kind of kind of song. Is that a very beautiful song? It is to the turkey. Yeah. Yeah. And all the other birds started to come down. Soon the sparrow came down, and the finch, and the hummingbird, and the duck, and the goose, and all the birds of the forest came down. Until soon, there were only two birds left up in the air. It was the hawk and that great eagle. Oh, they were straining their wings as hard as they could, but soon a oh, hawk could go no higher. And so he turned and started to glide back down to the Turtle Island. And as he was coming down, he heard a very powerful song in his ears. It's the song that he sings right to this day. But now it's just the eagle up in the air, and he's flapping his wings, and he starts to brag and boast to himself. I knew it, he said. I knew I could go the highest. I'm going to get the best song. And he flapped his wings even more. But soon, even the eagle oh, could go no higher. So he turned and started to glide back down to the Turtle Island. On his way down, he heard the wind and the clouds rushing by his ears. Ooh, it mixed together to make a very powerful song. And that eagle sings that song right to this day. But there was somebody else that heard that song too. It was that little thrush up under the eagle's wing. Oh, he heard that song and it woke him up and he looked out from under the eagle's wing and he said, Oh, I almost missed this contest. I have to fly up into the air. So he jumped out from under the eagle's wings and he flapped his wings even more. And he went up even higher. The eagle saw him and he said, Oh, thrush, what are you doing? How did you get up here into the air? And that thrush turned and said, Hey, Mr. Eagle, thanks for the ride. Now I'm going to go higher and I'm going to get the best song. And he turned and flew up even higher. Oh, that eagle, he was very angry, but he was too tired to chase after the thrush. So he went back down to the turtle island and he told all the other birds what thrush had done. Well, thrush is going up and up and up and soon he comes to the top of the sky dome, that blue dome that's up above us. And he finds a little hole in the sky dome. He decided to fly through that hole. And when he did, he came in to the sky world, or the spirit world. It's kind of the Haudenosaunee people's idea of heaven. Well, when he flew into that world, he listened and he heard the sky people singing their songs. He heard the wind going through the trees. He heard the grasses rustling back and forth. The water going through the brooks. It all mingled together to make beautiful music. That will be my song, said the thrush. He listened to it. He remembered it. And then he flew back down through that hole. And he went all the way back down to the Turtle Island. 
When he got back down, he stood up on top of the council rock and he said, all of you birds, listen to me. I went up the highest. I got the best song. Let me sing it for you. But all of those birds, they were looking at the thrush very crossly. And they said, no, thrush. Eagle came down and told us what you did. How you cheated to go up and get the best song. So we don't want to hear you sing at all. Ooh, that thrush, he started to feel bad inside. He knew he had done something wrong. He tried to defend himself. And he said, Eagle, he was bragging and boasting. He was making us all feel very bad. I wanted to show him that someone could go up even higher. Well, the birds, they got to thinking about this. And they had a little council. And then they came back to that thrush. And they said, no, thrush. What you say is true. Eagle was bragging and boasting. He should not have done that. But what you did was even worse. You cheated to win a special prize. And because you cheated, we don't want to hear your song at all. Oh, that thrush, he felt very bad inside. He felt so bad, he flew off into the forest, and he found some very thick bushes. He crawled under those bushes, and that's where he built his nest. That's where that thrush lives right to this day. And he hardly ever comes out. So today we call him Hermit Thrush. But every once in a while, Hermit Thrush, he comes out and he lifts up his voice and he sings the most beautiful song that you could ever imagine. Oh, all the other birds, they stop singing because they know that Thrush, he has the best song. But whenever we hear the Hermit Thrush sing that song, we are always reminded of the lesson that we can learn about how he cheated to get that special prize. And now I'll say, Donejo. That story is done. All right. Oh, thank you so much. How are we doing? Woohoo! We got to hustle, hustle. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. I get a little bit of a workout up here when I tell my stories this way. But I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to take, we have time, we got time for one more? A short one? Okay. Oh, we got to hustle, hustle, hustle. Okay. All right. Let's have one more story. Let's have one more story. And I think the story that I want to tell you right now, I'm trying to think of a quick one to tell you, I'm going to tell you a very, very short version of a very fun story to tell. And some of our stories among the Haudenosaunee that we tell are very, very long. We have one story about how the whole world got created. And that one takes three days to tell the whole thing. We have another story that talks about how we joined ourselves together in this union. Well, that one takes 10 days to tell the whole thing. Some guys are a little slow, and it takes them 12 days to tell the whole story. We want to hurry those guys up a little bit. So we have lots of these long, long stories, but they teach us so many important things. They teach us about our history. They teach us about these lessons, about the proper way to behave. Which one is worse, cheating? Or bragging and boasting? Cheating, cheating is worse. They're both bad, but cheating is even worse, just like we learned in that story. So we can learn about values and beliefs that we have, like in that story we just heard. Okay, but one other thing that stories do is they teach us about nature. Now let me ask you this question. Who knows what a black bear looks like? Anyone know what a black bear looks like? Yeah? Does the black bear have a big long tail or a little short tail? He's got a little short tail. This is how the black bear got that little short tail. Well, this story happened a long, long time ago, back when the great Turtle Island was brand new. And back at this time, there was an animal that lived in the forest that had a very long, very shiny, very puffy, very beautiful tail. And his name was Black Bear. Woohoo! That black bear loves his tail more than almost anything else in the whole world. And he loved to stomp around and strut around and wave that tail up in the air. And he would say, everyone come out and look at my tail. Oh, it's the best around. And he would wave that tail up in the air for everyone to see. Ooh, the other animals, they hated to hear the black bear say these things. But everyone was jealous also. Because everyone had to admit that Black Bear had the best tail. 
Well, that bear, he loved his tail so much, he loved to stomp around and strut around and make fun of all the other animals. Look at you, Mr. Beaver, with your mashed up tail. Ah, ha, 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 my tail is so much better than yours. And you little raccoon, oh, ho, ho, with the funny stripes on your tail, my tail is much better than yours. Oh, he would make everyone feel very bad inside. Now, there was one guy who felt bad most of all, and his name was Fox. Fox also has a long, shiny, puffy, very beautiful tail. And Fox thought to himself, you know, if Black Bear didn't have his tail, then I would have the best tail in the whole forest. And Fox is a very tricky kind of guy. You've got to be careful when you're around him. He'll make mischief for you if you're not careful. Well, one day the fox was sitting next to a pond of water, and it was winter time, so that pond was frozen over with ice. When all of a sudden he heard that black bear crashing through the forest, coming down to the pond, talking about his wonderful tail, and ooh, that just burned the fox right up. So he got one of these tricky fox ideas up in his head. He quick ran out onto the center of that pond, and he bent down and he cut a hole into the ice. He took his pouch and he took some dried corn and sprinkled it down into the hole. All the fish that were down below, they came up to get something to eat. And so he bent down and he scooped a couple of them out. He made a little pile right on the ice, right next to the hole. Just then the bear came to the edge of the pond, came crashing through the bushes. So as fast as he could, the fox, he sat down onto the ice but he curled his tail up under him so it wouldn't fall into the water. Oh, uh, hello out there! Hello out there, Mr. Fox, said the black bear. Um, uh, what are you doing with those delicious looking fish? Because fish is one of bear's favorite foods. Well, that fox, he's sitting there. And he puts on kind of a sad face, you know sad voice. He, he looks around. Oh, uh, good day to you, uh, Mr. Black Bear. Uh, I'm just sitting here trying to catch some fish, but, but my tail is not very beautiful. It does not make a good fishing line. I'm afraid I'm going to be hungry later. Oh, wow, that bear. His ears, they perked right up. Someone was talking about fish. Mmm. Someone was talking about tails. Woo! So he says, oh, Mr. Fox. I have a beautiful tail, best in the whole forest. Maybe my tail would be a good fishing line. And this is just what the tricky fox wanted to hear. So he jumps up and says, oh, Mr. Bear, that's a good idea. Come on out here and I'll show you what to do. Oh, that bear, he thinks he's going to get some fish. So he jumps himself up and he goes running out onto that pond and he gets out there and he looks down and he sees the fish. Oh, his belly starts to rumble. The fox says, now, Mr. Bear, you got to sit down right here on the ice, right next to the hole. Take that big, beautiful tail. Stick it down in the water. When the fish in, they'll think that it's food. They'll bite onto the end. And then you jump up and pull them out. And then we'll have a great feast. Oh, uh... I don't know, Mr. Fox, said the bear. That water looks really, really cold. Well, that's the only way I know how to catch fish, said the fox, telling a fib. And there was only one thing in the whole world that bear loved more than his tail, and that was a belly full of fish. So he says, okay, Mr. Fox, we'll catch these fish together. So he goes over to that hole, and he sits himself down on the ice, and he grits his teeth, and he sticks his tail down in the water. And he's sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, waiting for the fish. But do you think any fish ever come? No, not with his tail down in the water. So the fox, he runs around and gets behind the bear, and he stands there for a while, and he stands there for a while, and he knows there's no way that silly bear is going to catch any fish with his tail in the water. So he gathers up the fish that he already caught and he sneaks away into the forest. He takes them back to his own den and he roasts them up and bakes a wonderful meal for himself. Oh, he gets a full belly. Belly is so full that he lays down and he goes to sleep. 
He sleeps all night long. That night in the forest, there's a big storm. A lot of snow comes down, and it gets to be very cold. The next morning when Fox wakes up, he pokes his head up out of his den. He looks around at all the new snow, and he thinks, oh, I wonder if that bear is still sitting on the ice. And he decides to go and check. He goes walking down to the pond like a fox will do. He pokes his head up through the bushes, and when he looks out, he sees a huge mound of snow. And from underneath, he hears a great snoring sound. So he knows that Bear has fallen asleep. But then he sees something else, something that gives him another tricky idea. That hole in the ice, frozen up again. And Bear's tail is still down in the water. So now, as quietly as he can, the fox sneaks out onto the ice, and he gets up behind the bear, and then as loud as he can, he yells, Now, bear, now, there are the fish! Jump up, jump up, jump up! And that bear is sitting there, and he wakes up with a stir. Oh, oh, the fish, he says, I gotta get up! And he knocks all the snow off, and he jumps himself up, and he feels a great pulling on his tail. I must have a giant fish, he says. Oh, he starts pulling, oh, he's pulling, oh, and finally he falls forward. He spins around to see what kind of fish he caught. But do you think he sees any fish? Oh, no, all he sees is his tail wagging up at him out of the ice. That bear had pulled so hard, his tail had come right off. He spins around to see what's left, and all he has is a little tiny stub. Oh, ho, ho, that fox, he's laughing and rolling around and holding his belly. Oh, ho, ho, too bad for you, Mr. Black Bear. Now I have the best tail in the whole forest. And the fox ran off to tell everybody what happened. Oh, that bear, he was so sad. He grabbed a hold of his tail. Uh, uh, uh. But he couldn't pull it out of the ice. It was stuck in there. He was so sad, he lumbered off into the forest, and he went and he found a cave. He crawled into that cave and laid down there, and he was so sad that he went to sleep, and he slept all winter long. And now, whenever the black bear sees snow come down, he sees ice on the ponds, he goes and gets into that cave. He stays there all winter. He doesn't want to take the chance of losing the little piece of tail that he has left. Donahoe, that story is done. Oh, thank you so much, thank you. Thank you so much. That is all the time that we have for stories right now. I do hope that you enjoyed them. I hope you enjoyed them at home also. Everybody wave goodbye to the people watching at home. There you go, fantastic. If you like these stories, come on back. We got, I think, uh, at 2.30. Uh, no, at 3 o'clock we're in here, and then 3.30, one crazy raven will be out in the atrium. So if you're still around, be sure to watch him also. Thanks so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day.